so uh, chapter two takes us through some of the same material that we've been looking at in chapter one, but now we're looking at it in, in greater detail and in greater depth. So the same things that we've looked at before with two kinds of arguments, deductive and inductive, we're going to hit that again. Uh, what we're going to look at today are two main things about arguments that complicate them a bit. And these come up all the time in real life. So you're going to want to pay very close attention to this because this will help you out when you're dealing with the transition from the sort of artificial arguments that we play with here to thinking about arguments in the workplace, in advertising, in politics, in uh, your personal life, all those places where you make claims and then have to support them. And the first thing we're going to talk about is what we call complex arguments. Now your book doesn't use this term. Your book talks about um, premises and conclusions. Uh, actually, I think it talks about it in terms of conclusions used as premises. And if you haven't been following along, you might say, well, wait a second. You know, a conclusion is one kind of thing, a premise is another kind of thing in an argument. So how can something be a conclusion and a premise? What's the answer to that? You know, how can, think about it this way. Um, can a man be both a son and a father? Yeah. Can a, mother, can a woman be a mother and, and a daughter? To the, to the same person? No. Right? Well, maybe if there's some sort of weird time travel thing, like they have in certain movies. Um, I don't know, would that involve incest? I think, it, I think it probably would have to, wouldn't it? Um, so, probably want to stay away from that one. Huh? Um, if I'm somebody's son, I'm somebody's son in relation to their being my parent. Parent is a relational term. Son is a relational term. If I am somebody's father, which I am, that's also a relational term. And, you know, we, we also have ways of signifying the, the relationships between the two parts. So, my mother, um, her relationship to my son is, she's grandmother, right? And every culture has these sorts of things. These are what we call relational terms. There's other relational terms, too, like... Um, um, Boss employee, right? Uh, how many of you have bosses? How many of you are the boss? Any of you? Just, just a few. Um, I'm not. Or am I? I? I'm a boss of a few things. But in general, we all have bosses, right? Do those bosses have bosses? Yeah. So it's the same sort of thing, relational terms, with um, arguments the components of arguments, premises and conclusions. So think about it like this. You have a argument with some premises, and those premises lead to a conclusion. Okay, so here is one argument. Now is it possible for that conclusion to be a premise in another argument? Yeah, we do this all the time, actually. So that conclusion might be one premise, and it might be another premise, and then this leads to another conclusion. And some arguments may go on like this quite a ways. They, they can have complicated chains. Um, think about when you're drawing inferences about um, somebody's character. Let's pick something that somebody does that makes you a little bit suspicious about it. Anything you like. What puts you on your guard? What's that? Say cheating. Cheating. Okay. Um, let's put that one, let's put that one towards the end because that's pretty big. Let's say we want really small things. So, what might clue you into the fact that somebody might be a cheater? What opens up that possibility? Why? 
Okay, so they start lying about small things, things that really aren't that important, that they don't gain anything uh, in lying about. So let's say the argument establishes that, um, we'll call him Jim. <coughs> Jim is a liar. So that's our, that's our conclusion of one argument. And maybe it's an inductive argument. You, you've noticed Jim lying on five different occasions. Um, you've actually caught him in it, right? Those are your premises. Now, if he's lying habitually for no good reason, I think that's more or less what we mean by when we say somebody's a liar, right? That can be a, a premise over here. Jim is a liar. And maybe you say something. Now, I'm not saying this is a very good argument, but this, this is just for practice. Let's say we say that uh, if Jim lies, he is likely to cheat. You probably agree to that, right? Somebody who's lying a lot is a good chance they're cheating. Conclusion is, Jim is a cheater. Now notice, you've got two different arguments here. Right? You could also work backwards. Let's say, um, for any friend that, that, that you criticize, or actually any, any person that you criticize, you can always find somebody to defend them, can't you? And when they're defending them, Quite often they'll say something like, well, how do you know that they're a liar? How do you know that they're a cheater? Well, you get, with the cheater thing, you could say, well, here's my argument. Here's why I think so. Here's, here's my claim I want you to believe. Here's the support for it. Let's say they don't accept the idea that Jim's a liar. How do you know he's a liar? Well, what do you do then? You work backwards and you give another argument. So you notice this can work two different ways. We can continue inferences in chains like that. And when somebody starts questioning whether we have good reason for the things that we're beginning with, the starting points, the premises, you can provide arguments for them. This is what you do in ordinary life all the time, don't you? Because you are challenged by other people when you make claims, aren't you? Or any of you treated as if you're an oracle who's, who's never wrong and, and everybody says, oh, so-and-so said it, must be true. Any of you have that, that condition? It'd be kind of enviable, wouldn't it? But um, maybe some of you will, you know. Maybe some of you will attain the status of an Oprah someday. You know, where people will say, Oprah says, therefore it must be right. Um, although you can still find people to, to criticize that too, can't you? Pretty much anything that you claim, somebody else, maybe just out of stubbornness, can take exception to it. And then what are you going to do? Well, you want to trace your way back. You want to be able to give further reasons. Why do you believe this? Um, well, here's my reasons. So you can go backwards and you can go forwards with it. You can also have arguments where um, the structure gets even more complex. Say we get rid of this liar business. Um, you might have another argument. Conclusion. You might have another argument where Both of the conclusions in the earlier bits of the argument are functioning as premises. When you write a research paper, this is the way your research papers work. If you're writing them all right, right? If you don't get it back with red ink, where the uh, professor, or you might have had this happen in, in high school, where your teacher says, what is your evidence for this? What's your support for this? Why are you saying this? What they're asking you to do is to actually back up the claims that you're making. Because premises are, are claims, just like a conclusion is a claim. So that premise might be a conclusion of another argument. 
if you look at um, if you look at famous arguments that are made in history, like um, one that I've, I've done quite a bit of work with is Martin Luther King's letter from the Birmingham jail. Um, that's a complex argument. See, here's the, here's the thing. You can, you can use the word argument in several senses. This is an argument. Right? Premises leading to conclusion. This is an argument. This is also an argument. And this whole thing, let me erase this, all of this can also be called an argument. You may want to clarify when somebody starts talking about, well, my argument is this. What exactly do you mean by argument here? Do you mean this, this piece, which is by itself an argument? Do you mean the whole thing? If it's more complex, you, maybe you mean the first ten pages. Um, those are all ways of connecting claims together, right? Think of it sort of like um, when you were kids, you played with a, a variety of toys where you put things together, right? Legos. What else? Tinker toys. Mega blocks. What else do kids have? If you didn't, you actually missed out on, on some basic cognitive development. That's why we give kids those toys. Because the act of actually putting things together is part of what helps you develop as a, a uh, the kind of animal that we are, rational animals, human beings. That's why we give kids those toys. Part of, part of your development relies on you actually doing things with your hands and seeing connections. So if you didn't get that sort of stuff, that's unfortunate. Um, if you have kids and you're not doing that with them, that's unfortunate too. Because that's just like this. You know, this is sort of like putting together a couple blocks. And then those blocks can connect with other blocks. This is what we do in speech. This is what we do with, with uh, thought. And this is what many great works of literature are. Um, one of the things that I'm having this section of the class read this semester is Plato's Credo, right? Plato's Credo has this sort of structure of argument. What is, what is Socrates' um, main claim in the, the Credo? His most absolute thing, his big decision. It's not leaving Yeah, I, I should not um, leave Athens, even though they're going to kill me. Well, they're going to make me drink, drink poison. They're not going to kill me directly, but his claim is it would be wrong. Well, his claim is I should not leave Athens, and it would be wrong of me to do so. Why would it be wrong? Well, he gives an entire argument for that, doesn't he? He brings in the laws, and the laws are, are criticizing him. Socrates, what are you thinking about running away for? You're going to hurt us, and you owe us something. There's a whole bunch of arguments there. That's part of what I'm having you do this semester in reading the Credo, uh, is learn how to apply all this stuff about complex arguments. That's the training ground for you guys. Um, so if you haven't started reading the, the Credo yet and thinking in terms of arguments, you want to start doing that. Um, but that's not the only thing that he says. He also says, you know, Credo, you think that it would be a bad thing in other senses for, for me to stay, but actually, would I be helping my children by, by leaving? No. I would actually be giving them a bad example, wouldn't I? That's a different reason for him to stay. Um, he has some other reasons in there. Should we care about what the, the many think? Or should we care about what those who actually know things think? Um, that's a question. His, his answer to that is what? Play, uh, uh, Socrates. We don't know. We, we do know where Plato sits because if Socrates is saying it, that's that's Plato basically. But Plato doesn't show his hand directly. He puts it in Socrates' mouth. What does Socrates think? Should we care about what the many think? Yes. Really? Yes. No. Credo says, yeah, we have to care about what the many think. Socrates says, I thought we agreed that we don't have to. The many don't know what they're talking about. 
Um, that, that is the case, too, quite often. That's the whole reason he's staying for everybody else. Uh, that's not the whole reason. That's a good question. If we have a, a complex argument like this, the I should stay, that's a claim. There is an a whole reason. There's a number of different reasons. Right? And each one is supported by more argument. Um, ultimately, the main reason he's saying is because he thinks it's the right thing to do. But how does he get to that point? You see him unveiling this in his discussion with, with Credo. And Socrates already knows this. As a matter of fact, what's going on in the dialogue is he's leading Credo, who is in doubt about this. So Credo's very upset, isn't he? He thinks that it's not the right thing for Socrates to say to stay. And why does he um, come into the, the jail? He's bribed the guards. He's, he's not only um, upset about it, he's taken action. He's ready to get Socrates out of there to <coughs> save his life. Um, but it's going to require him to betray his country, to go against uh, the many. Well, the many and the wise, because the, the laws are part of the country too, aren't they? And the many change their minds all the time. See, the many are not critical thinkers. The many just go wherever their opinion leads them, and, and they go by feeling, or, you know, Somebody sways them. We're going to look at a fallacy later on in the semester called the argument from popularity, or the appeal to popularity. Just because many people think something is true doesn't make it true at all. Um, what you want to do is look at what do the people who actually know about, um, what do they think about it? Actually, another way of thinking about this, what's your job here in college? What are you supposed to become? Right now, many of you are the many. If you don't have the answers to the questions that I'm asking in class, you are the many. Uh, they're not ready yet at hand. Let's become individuals, free thinkers, thinkers. Right. Not just free thinkers. The many are free thinkers. They're free to think all sorts of crazy things that they don't have any sort of support for. Anybody's free to have any opinion they like. Anybody's free to study things if they want to. Anybody's free to be ignorant, to be knowledgeable. You're completely free in that respect. Being a free thinker is not that, that important. Being a critical thinker, actually having reasons for what you say, for what you think, and then being able to back those up. That's what's key. That's what people are going to pay you to do. They won't pay you to show up with, without having you know, looked at things or having opinions about it that are well-reasoned. They're not going to pay you just to, to show up on time. They're going to pay you for actually knowing your stuff. Knowing your stuff means being able to do this. It's going to vary from, from person to person. Um, some of you are going into business. Some of you are going into counseling, some of you are going into what, criminal justice, those are different areas. But the same basic structure is going to hold in every case. If you want to make this, um, this college degree work for you, one of the basic skills that you're going to have to have, and that you want to actually bring to every single class session you come to, is being able to go through this whole chain. All right? um, let's look at a, another way we might, might do this. Let's say we start out, let's make a very complex argument. Um, what's a claim that affects your lives as college students? Something that you can say something about, take some sort of stand on. There's a lot of stuff going on right now, at least at, at this university, actually nationwide that is affecting your college education, right? Finances. What's that? The finances. Yeah, finances. So, what matters to you? As far as finances go? Yeah, in college. Even costs relatively low. Okay. So, and what are your main costs? Tuition. Right. It's not, it's not so much the books. Tuition costs you more, right? Not the books anymore. What's that? Not the books anymore. Yeah, because you have the, the rental program. Although it doesn't cover everything, but it's, it's pretty good for you. 
Um, imagine how much you'd have to pay if you didn't have that rental program. Well, when I was going to the tenant the first two years, uh -huh. tuition was about seven hundred dollars per semester, about twelve credit hours. Yeah, and books were anywhere from five to nine hundred dollars. Wow! So you paid more in books sometimes than you did in tuition. Just by their time. Yeah, the community colleges have very affordable tuition. Um, the higher you go up in in uh, rigor, the more expensive it gets. FSU is actually pretty cheap, um, and the UNC system is actually pretty cheap in comparison to other places. But it, it's still expensive, and what have they done recently with your tuition? Yeah, actually I think the last two years, haven't they? They've, they've raised your tuition? Those of you who look with sort of blank expressions, um, you're going to pay for this eventually. If you have a loan, um, and they keep raising tuition, you're going to pay for it. Some of you have grants, but that's not going to cover your entire college career, I think. And they decided that insurance. Yeah, your, your student health insurance. Yeah, and then you have various student fees too, right? They tack on other things. And there's a lot of hidden fees too, aren't there? Like, uh, how much do you guys get for, for your print account? Forty bucks, right? No, it's forty. Oh. For a whole year, it's like. Oh, for a whole year, yeah. You get like forty forty dollars a semester, I believe. Nine dollars or something like that. Yeah. There ain't no way you can use all that. Well, I know students who go through it like that. If you're actually downloading research papers and printing them out, which all of you should actually be doing at one point or another, um, that gets burned up very quickly. If you're printing out all the things that your instructor expects you to print out, it can go pretty quick. Especially if you're doing multiple drafts or papers and things like that. So, money is tight for students. So this is a concern. This is something, now we have a topic, now we can come up with an issue. Um, whether your tuition should be raised. I mean, this is a live issue. The UNC system is, is out of money. The state of North Carolina is out of money. We're facing 15% budget cuts likely this year. Um, we've cut staff for the last two years. We've frozen a lot of accounts. Um, travel is, is, you know, right now at 75% payment. Pretty soon it's going to be 0% payment for faculty travel. Um, all these things are, are signs of the, the situation that we're in. So it's likely that they're going to raise tuition. Um, if you students actually wanted to do something about it, now would be the time to start making your argument to, who would you make it to? You wouldn't make it to us professors. We might help you structure it. But we don't have any say in it, do we? Who sets your tuition? North Carolina. Nope. Chancellor. Chancellor would be the first person that you'd want to send a letter to. He has a lot of power over the institution. Um, the state of North Carolina by itself doesn't set the tuition. Each institution gets to decide what it's going to do. Um, so let's say you wanted to write a letter as students to the chancellor, and let, let's figure out what your basic claim is. It's something about tuition. You're, you're not happy about it. Is that all you'd want to say? We're not happy. We, we can use that later on as something. Is that the ultimate claim you want to make? What's the ultimate claim? What's the main point you want to get across to them? too much. Um, we'll hold on to, to that. But what are they what are they thinking about doing? Us, I mean, the more it raises, the less education you're gonna get for the money you're paying. Okay. Now that's a that's a good concern and we'll bring all that stuff in. But what is the most basic claim that everything else that you're gonna say is there is stop raising tuition. Okay, we've got that frame now as an imperative or a command. And we can change commands into what kind of statements? Should. Remember we talked about value judgments the other day? Um, how would you frame it? You should what? Stop writing the tuition. Okay, that'll work. You <coughs> should <coughs> stop. Raising tuition. 
Now, that is the conclusion of the argument that you would be making. All these other concerns that you guys have brought up, which are very good, those could be reasons why. Um, students are unhappy when you raise it, right? Well, that, that's true, isn't it? That's a valid concern. Well, what else did you guys have? Um, the more that uh, maybe it, it would be long to raise the price when you're getting less service. I think that could be a very persuasive point. You know, in other companies, if they're if they're cutting your services, they should be cutting your price, right? What were you gonna say, Mr. Snow? Large tuition increases can uh, cause many people not to afford it. Yeah, that's another key issue. Um, sometimes they talk about that as pricing students out, right? Um, so let's say well, you're pricing students out of an education. Now, you could write that letter and you could have these three points. You might come up with many more too. Um, what do you expect the, the response might be from the people who read it? Um, they may accept some of the points, they may not though. So what do you have to do then? Well, then you've got to figure out how you're going to support these points. Now you're dealing with a complex argument, aren't you? These are premises, but they're also going to be conclusions and other arguments. So if students are unhappy, why should, why should you care? Why is that important? Stated or implicit premises, we'll use this. Um, so, okay, somebody says, Well, what do I care if the students are unhappy? You say, Look, buddy, I pay your salary. My tuition goes to that. Not exactly true, unfortunately, because uh, your tuition only pays a little sliver of it. Actually, state, state funds pay for most of it. But, okay, you have some sort of grounds to stand on. It's wrong to raise the price uh, when you're giving less services. Um, you can make a case for that, right? Let's say somebody says, well, why shouldn't I raise the price when you are giving less services? I mean, everything's costing me more. If you have a company um, and it, it, it's uh, raw materials are costing it more, it just passes it on to you. Think about the gas stations, right? All of you buy gas at one time or another? Yeah. And prices go up and go down. And if you go to the gas station and complain, what do they tell you? Well, it's called, oil is costing us more, so we have to pass on the, the, sometimes they pass the savings on to you, usually they're passing the costs on to you, right? So maybe the university says that. Is there anything you can say in response to, to back this up, that, that is wrong to um, raise the price as well, providing less services? I'll let you think about that one. That one's kind of complicated. Um, but let's say we could come up with something. Then we'd have another argument. Okay? Um, you're pricing students out of an education. Let's say somebody doubts that. What would you do? What do you do in any class when the instructor doubts the claims that you're making in a paper? Okay, you could, um, yeah, so you could do some sort of research, and <clears throat> the kind of research that you're doing might be polling, okay, um, maybe you poll FSU students 
here and say, if they raise with this amount, will you continue to go to SSU? Yeah, that could be good support. And this, again, would be another argument. So you have a very large, complex argument. Notice you started with just one thing. Actually, you know what you did is you started with one main claim and a bunch of different ideas just sort of bouncing around. And what did we do? We imposed some structure on them. If you were going to write this letter, do you think you'd be better armed, more ready um, to write that letter now with this sort of stuff up on the board than with all of these things just sort of bouncing around in your head? So you see the usefulness of diagramming arguments, of laying these things out. When you're reading the credo, you should be doing this. You should be thinking about what are the arguments that are being made in the claims and see if you can set them out in some sort of structure. When you're preparing for other classes, reading documents in other classes that have arguments, you want to do this sort of thing. Yeah. This is just a little side note. The whole point of us getting the lottery in the state of North Carolina was to improve education all the way around. What's the problem? We're broke. We're more broke now than we were when they started it. You're not the only state in that case. Uh, Illinois um, did the same thing with their lottery, and they make the same complaints Wisconsin did. These states that um, it's not an education lottery at all. Yeah, the states that that it put lotteries into place. The argument. Now notice. Arguments always have to be made in politics to get people to, to make changes. And one of the changes was, let's have a lottery. And the argument was, uh, we will use the money just for education. Um, it'll be earmarked or set aside or stuff like that. Um, and why did they have to do that? Because a lot of people were saying lotteries are a bad thing. They, they uh, impact the poor more than the rich. Um, they, they're not a really good proposition. It's really the state imposing an extra tax. And yeah, actually they've, they've done studies with gambling in general when, for instance, when a casino comes in, a lot of times people will make the argument, it's going to be great for us because jobs, you know, it's going to improve a depressed area. And yeah, some jobs go up, but not an awful lot. And rates of alcoholism, divorce, uh, bankruptcy, all those things uh, go up as well. Um, yeah, there's some, some interesting arguments to be made about this. Let's, there's one other thing I want, to, I want to talk about. So let's look just at this little argument here. Um, I've done a sort of abbreviated, you know, structure and, and making the claims just so we could fit everything on the blackboard. Um, and this is actually the way that we do argue. Somebody says, Students are unhappy, somebody else says, why should I care about that? And the response is, well, you know, we are paying your salary. Now, there's an argument there, or at least the start of an argument, but not everything is above the board. Not everything is visible yet. So let's put it over here. Students are unhappy and... Is that really all, you know, where they're, they're going with it? No, actually, students are unhappy. Um, why does that actually matter? Um, they're not, not all of this has been spelled out. Some of it is just in your head. You're assuming that the other person understands this. This is what we call implicit or unstated. Um, why does it matter if students are unhappy? You know, what are we assuming here? It's a bad thing. I mean, maybe uh, there are some institutions where it's good to make people unhappy. You know, uh, I'm not saying this as uh, advocating it myself, but a lot of people uh, make arguments about prison, and they say prison should be a terrible place. We shouldn't perform prisons. We want them to be as awful as possible, so that they're a real punishment. This is not a prison, so you shouldn't be unhappy, right? Um, students are unhappy. We don't want students to be unhappy. We could spell out a lot of other things. Let's say we look at the, at the other end, though. Um, students are unhappy. Students are the clients paying your salary. Now, if all we have, if 
The only thing that's up for consideration are these two claims. This claim is not really connected to this yet. How do we get from here to here? What do we have to be assuming on the part of the speaker and on the part of the, uh, the listener, the person who's being addressed? Somehow this has to be connected to this. And you do think they're connected, right? Because um, if you were making these arguments, you, you would say something like this as a response to, well, you know, who cares? Students are the clients paying your salary. Um, what's the assumption? If somebody's paying your salary. You should care about what they, how they feel. Um, their, let's say, their feelings um, are important. You know, in other in other businesses, if you don't like the way a restaurant serves you, you quit going there, don't you? Uh, Education is a little bit different. Sometimes people think it's okay to screw students around because uh, they're they're always going to be there. You know. Um, Students are the clients paying your salary. If somebody's paying your salary, their feelings are important. Um, students are unhappy. You know, um, what's being actually implied by this? It's your job to um, make them happy. Or at least, you know, content. And these things, notice these assumptions, you're assuming that the other person gets those. If they were going to be obstinate and say, well, who cares if, if they're, they're my clients? You might actually spell it off for me. You might say, look, I think you don't quite understand what it means to be a, you know, a supplier to a client. You actually have to make the client happy about something or else they're going to quit going to you. You should care about that. Um, if they say, well, okay, so the students are unhappy, why does that matter? You, you can say, it's your job to make them happy. This is something implicit, right? Um, and if we think about this now, what we can actually see is that these two things kind of go together, don't they? You add them to this, this is really the conclusion, isn't it? This is the conclusion that you can draw. Students are unhappy, it's your job to do something about that. Um, students are unhappy is actually a premise, not a conclusion, if you frame it this way. Notice, premises, conclusions, something can be both a premise and be a conclusion at the same time. Um, something can switch its role, depending on how you frame the argument. And as you think through arguments, you will find these things changing. That's okay. Uh, don't, don't feel like you're not getting it if you find that, that something is changing from a premise to a conclusion. That probably means you're actually getting it. You're, you're doing your job. Premises and conclusions, relational terms. A premise is a premise if it's supporting something. A conclusion is a conclusion if it's what is being supported. Just like a you know, father is a father if they have you know, begotten some children. A child is the child of somebody who has, you know. So students have a client paying your salary is now a conclusion? Uh, the one no. Talking. That that's one of the premises. But Generally when, we're, when, generally, when we're sketching these things, uh, the convention is premises on top, conclusion right. on the bottom. This is the real conclusion. It's your job to care about what you know, your clients think. I thought you just said that was now the premise. No, I said that, that, that this, students are unhappy, if we think about it, is really functioning as a premise, not, okay. not as a conclusion. Um, yeah. Now, when you argue, when you make real-life arguments, you're assuming things on the part of your listeners all the time. If I say, um, well, let's use the old example that we use all the time. Uh, it, it's snowing today, uh, therefore class is canceled. I've left some stuff out. What have I left out? What's the assumption? 
Uh, as I say, it's snowing. Class is canceled. I've already said class is canceled. Yeah, it, it, or something more like if it snows, then right. And we assume these sort of if thens all the time. We'll say one thing, and then we immediately say another thing, and we don't spell out the if then. Why? Because we assume that the audience knows that. And if they look at us with a blank face, um, you know, like for instance, my first snowfall down here, I showed up. Because, you know, I'm from Wisconsin. So it takes a lot of snow before I'm not going to show up to, to work. As a matter of fact, in Wisconsin, if there's you know, like four inches of snow and you don't show up to work, you're written up. But here, you know, I, didn't, I didn't realize that one of the bits of background knowledge is if it snows, the whole place shuts down. And, and we can explain why. Why is that the case? Somebody might say, yeah, that doesn't sound right. Well, F uh, not FSU, Fayetteville doesn't have, what, the, what do they need? That They don't have a whole fleet of snow plows. Cities in the north have snow plows. I think they do have snow plows, but, but uh, not, not a lot. Most of them see motor graders. What's that? Motor graders. I still couldn't hear that. Motor graders. Motor graders. Okay. Then you switch those over to snow plows. There we go. See, now this is all background knowledge. This, these are things that we have to assume. You guys would know more about that than I would. So, all right, I'll.